Hello, this is Sean Martin, Editor-in-Chief for ITSP Magazine, and you're very welcome to a panel here on Bright Talk. At ITSP Magazine, we, uh, we capture and share stories at the intersection of IT security and society, and we, we capture the human element as it, and the technolo technological element as it impacts the way we live our lives, do our jobs, and vice versa. So today, we're going to be capturing a story around managing cyber risk. So thank you all for joining us today for this session. Uh, just a couple housekeeping items. If you're logged into the app, of course, uh, watching us live, there's a Q&A panel that you can uh, submit questions to us for. I'll be monitoring that throughout this discussion and be happy to uh, either ask the panel for a, a response or if uh, the panel doesn't have a response, which I doubt, <laughs> I'll take it myself. But uh, let's, uh, let's get into it. We have a lot to cover today and all around managing risk. So obviously I'm not gonna just talk to you directly myself. I have a lovely panel here to, to help me with this. And I'm gonna start with Marjana. Can you introduce yourself a little bit about your, yourself and your company? Absolutely. Marjana Fuller, I'm a Chief Security Officer at SignalFX. SignalFX provides real-time monitoring analytics for microservices architecture. I've been building security programs from ground up at fast-growing companies for a number of years and focusing efforts on risk and prioritizing projects based on risk, prioritizing engineering time and product management time is absolutely critical to making sure that you build an effective program in a fairly short amount of time. And I'm Ed Bellis. I am the founder and uh, chief technology officer at uh, Kenna Security. Uh, I've been doing this now for about seven years. Prior to that, I was the chief information security officer uh, over at Orbitz for about six years. I've been entirely in security in my practitioner side, uh, about 25 plus years. And we, what we do at Kenna Security is effectively measure and monitor risk around vulnerabilities, misconfigurations, and application flaws as it relates to all of your uh, assets within your environment using exploit and threat intelligence that we're collecting across the internet. Hi, my name's Joe Kuchik and I'm the Chief Security Officer at Calvin Systems and uh, we focus on developing solutions for uh, on-prem cloud and containers um, and being able to prioritize that into a cyber posture intelligence score. Uh, prior to joining Calvin, I was at uh, Verizon. I uh, was in a product management group. I created Verizon Risk Report and the DBIR team reported to me. And I've been in the security space for over 20 years and worked for KPMG, PwC, uh, number two security executive at um, Citigroup and uh, general, and I was security executive at uh, General Motors Asset Management. Wonderful. Well, thank you all for, for joining us today. We're going to have, a, hopefully, a, a fun and lively conversation. Uh, certainly, every company has risk, whether they choose to accept it or not, right? Cyber risk as well. Mm -hmm. And I guess the, the question we want to help them answer today is how do they identify the risk they have? How do they then manage and mitigate that risk in a, in a successful way that doesn't counteract the, uh, the, the value of what they're trying to bring to their, their customers as a, as a product provider or service provider? So I'm going to ask uh, the panel for your definition or the, what, what is the goal of a risk management program? And, and I'm, I'm looking at you, so I'll start there. First. Sure, <laughs> sure, fair enough. Uh, so the goal of a risk management program in general is you, you need to be able to measure the risk, understand it, and really be able to understand what is tolerable for your organization around that, right? So there's a lot of frameworks you can use, whether it's FAIR, Octave, or NIST uh, has their own uh, cybersecurity uh, or cyber risk framework now as well, but there's there's several out there, and you know pick your du jour of, of frameworks that are out there. But the, really, the key is you need to not only it, it can't be this one-time assessment, and then you just go away for a year and then come back and say, okay, now what are our risks? Um, it's continuously evolving, and there's a lot of things that are at play there. Whether it's this the value of whatever it is that you're doing, the likelihood of something actually going awry, and then what is the impact if that does go awry, right? So being able to measure all that. In some cases, you may want to make decisions around either remediating that risk, eliminating that risk or you might choose to accept that risk, or there's a lot of different scenarios that you're gonna go through, but it's really, it's an ongoing program is one of the key things, and you can't just look at it as a snapshot or a static point in time. Mm -hmm. 
What I would like to highlight is that our risk assessment should never be a compliance activity. It should involve people from engineering, you should involve your most senior engineers, as well as people who just came on board because they always have great observations, to make sure that when you go through a risk assessment, to make sure when you do leverage compliance frameworks, you focus on the true technical uh, vulnerabilities and risks that then can be remediated either you know, by the security team or by engineering or by other business functions. So the so okay. I, I just want to add, I mean, I think today risk management has also evolved to, to being a business enabler mm -hmm. and a differentiator for a lot of companies if they do it right. Uh, so it allows them to move quicker with technologies and get, get go to market faster than the competitors if they utilize it in the right way rather than looking in the old way where it was looked as a compliance requirement. And let's dig into that a little bit more because that, that's really what I want to kind of highlight here is that it's not just about finding a vulnerability and, and closing that vulnerability, mm -hmm. right? It's, there's, there's some aspect of the business that's critical to that business for its operations and for its means to generate revenue and support its customers. And there are things that could impact those business process systems and what have you. So what, what types of risks might companies encounter that uh, might throw the business off kilter? Uh, I'll, I'll start right. um, and, and I'll say that, that the, much like cyber risk itself, that varies greatly across verticals, industries, what, what it is your company's doing, how big you are, how small mm -hmm. you are, um, I'll, I'll play a huge role in that. I've worked at companies as big as Bank of America and CSC and as little as Kenna Security uh, and the risks that we deal with are sometimes very much the same across the board and some of them are just completely and utterly different. Um, and it's it's just it's just such a broad area, uh, so you can't really focus and say, oh, there's just this one thing. The one common mistake that I do see, especially in technology companies or, or companies as, as as they start to deal with cyber risk specifically, is uh, I hear a lot about it's all about the data, and all you got to do is just protect the data, um, and that's partially true, but it's not all about the data, right? There's a whole lot of things that go into that. I'll, I'll use a common example in our world is, okay, so I've got, I'm looking at this system. Oh, it's not really that important. It's our, it's our public website. We don't collect any information. Um, it's, it's mostly just static brochureware type stuff. There's, there's no real data. If somebody hacked that public website, it wouldn't be that big of a deal. Except our public website maybe gets 5 million visitors a month, right? And if I've dropped malware or I've dropped some sort of persistent cross-site scripting and I'm using your website to attack all of your users, well, suddenly that is important. So being able to understand the full uh, picture of risk uh, and not just focusing on a single narrow Thing like the like the data, which is just one of many aspects. Really. Yeah, and it's what you described. Is it, most people think of it as an internal, how might things come at me, and yeah. how do I manage that risk? And what you just described is an outbound. Yeah, how yeah. it impacts mm -hmm. your customers and or society as a whole. Absolutely. Sean, it was mentioned that it should not, never be like a one-time activity, and that we need to understand the full picture. And that's something I could definitely agree with very strongly. And what I see happens a lot, um, engineering teams move very quickly, they adopt new technology very quickly, and security is not always involved in the process. So that's like one of the biggest risks I, you know, I see, I saw over the past months where new technology was adopted, configurations were not set to the uh, secure by default and that resulted in security incidents. So making sure that security team is uh, involved in all of the uh, engineering and PM decisions, making sure that your risk profile and all of the risk assessment activities are updated a long way is absolutely critical. What I would also add is, you know, looking at your supply chain, mm -hmm. your vendors, um, you know, if you looked at uh, financial services with FFIC, they started looking at that and mandating that back in 2006. But most of the other industries didn't have the same uh, process. And then you also had uh, NIST cybersecurity framework with the version 1.1, finally introducing su supply chain and looking at that as you go forward. So I think you know that's all known. I think some of the future things that you'll also have to start to focus on is your customers and the risk that your customers present to you as you start to have interactive uh, ecosystems with them that still hasn't been formulated yeah, in regu regulatory bodies yet. Yeah, and uh, certainly banking yeah. customers uh, yeah. play a critical role in that, right? So w when I think of security, I think of 
CAA, right? Confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And to me, those are like the core components of a security management program. Mm -hmm. is, is there a similar model or similar set of components for risk management? Or maybe not in the CIA, but the <laughs> other elements that you think play a role here? Oh, I, I will state to that, and without trying to stop on anybody there, the CIA, I think, is still, uh, it's, it plays a big role in that, right? So, but you're actually, you're looking at the risk as it relates to C, I, and A, right? So if I'm looking at a particular uh, threat that might happen, right? So who is the threat actor? Um, what is the likelihood of this threat event actually happening? Can I apply controls that reduce that likelihood or reduce the impact that, that's, uh, of this event actually occurring as it relates to confidentiality or as it relates to integrity or as it relates to my availability? Mm -hmm. So I still think it's, it's very much uh, just kind of serves as a framework to the overall risk methodology. Okay. And you know, prior to diving into that, uh, we need to understand what are the crown jewels. Mm -hmm. What are we trying to protect? And typically, that is your customer data. These are your credentials that could be potentially exploited to uh, break into your systems, and that's your source code. Once you have those elements outlined, then you can you know move forward with risk assessment and look at the uh, CIA. Yeah, you definitely need mm -hmm. to know your assets and right. know what you're trying to protect before you go out there and try to assess everything. But that's a bigger problem. Right. I was going to ask how, how well yeah. my personal experience is that's usually the first barrier. Right? Oh. Any, any org that I've run into of any significant size, uh, they're doing really well if they know about 70% of their assets. So, so does that mean because they don't know the other 30% they should not do risk management? No, it definitely <laughs> does not mean that. Uh, security nihilism is still a real thing and people I still see like, uh, oh, we can't. We can't protect it fully, so let's just not do anything at all, <laughs> um, which is obviously a really bad decision. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and also the, the remediation. Like, you'll hear a lot of stories about remediation, but in a lot of companies, you can't re me remediate. You want to mitigate because the, re the remediation may cause more trouble mm -hmm. than the actual vulnerability did. Um, and so being able to balance remediation and mitigation is a challenge that I think a lot of companies are still struggling with today. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And what you're trying to do really is you have, you're, you've assessed yourself at this certain level of risk and you want to get to this level of risk. So you want to mm -hmm. reduce, in many cases, you want to reduce your risk to get to that level. Sometimes it's remediation, sometimes it's some sort of mitigation or compensation, mm -hmm. but it's a way to get to that goal of where the acceptable risk is. Right, and you know, it's important to know how you're going to measure the risk, right? And looking at the likelihood of an incident, a financial impact of the incident, the mm -hmm. frequency of an incident is really helpful to determine like which risks should I address first, which of them should be remediated, which of them could be mitigated, and which of them we are going to accept. It goes, it goes all into likelihood there, right. for sure. So we, we identify the assets that are important. Those can be systems, data, services, customers, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Um, and then we apply some model to it. And that comes out with red, yellow, green, 68.7. What, what, what are we trying to produce as a risk score if we want to call it a score? What, what are we trying to come up with and how are we going to use that data to actually do something with it? Well, I, I think that there's a couple things you're trying to do with the output. One, you're trying to educate senior management, mm -hmm. executive management, and the board, which is becoming much more involved, especially with the National Association of Corporate Directors and their cybersecurity oversight uh, guidance document that they put out in 2017. So I, I think that part of it is an education and awareness. And also when you're working with your colleagues, it helps prompt your colleagues to be more responsive to doing things when they know that they're being scored and reported on. So I think that's one element of it. And the key thing is, you know, doing it in a way that's that's simple, right? You give too much data, you lose the message. So you want to have a clear message to go out there, and you want people to take actions to remediate the most important risk. So what you are trying to communicate, what's the highest risk, and how we can, tr you know, take action to to mitigate that risk um, and improve the cyber posture of a company as you go forward. So, so how does that work? Is that is it a red, yellow, green, high, medium, low? What is it? Some message 
uh, for each thing? What, what is it? I, well, obviously, we're, we're a little biased at Kenneth Security <laughs> and, what, and what it is that we produce, but um, I will absolutely agree with the fact that keep it as simple as possible, especially the higher up you're bubbling this, this report to or this uh, dashboard or whatever it is to, the, the more simplistic you need it to be, but it needs to be able to communicate it in terms of risk, right? Not in terms of security. And what I mean by that, and something that we do all the time is, don't take a list of vulnerabilities to your board of mm -hmm. directors, right? You're gonna get at best a, a bunch of glazed eyes, right? So you want to be able, and, and each of them are gonna be different, and maybe it's red, yellow, green, maybe it's mm -hmm. a number, maybe it's you know some sort of, uh, uh, qual uh, qualitative analysis, right? It's moderate risk or whatever it is you want to call it. Um, but something that you can basically establish that baseline and say, okay, that's great. This is where we are. This is where we want to be. And this is how we're going to get there. These are the steps that need to be taken in order to get there. This is the cost associated with getting there. This is what it means. Yeah. And you mentioned a like top top level score, but you can really break it down by domain. You can be doing like really well at identity and access management and really poorly at secure development lifecycle. Mm -hmm. And then like once you know that, you can effectively prioritize your resources and also look at what are the industry benchmarks, what are companies of my size doing, how well they are addressing those risks, what are the best in class companies doing, and definitely strive to move towards the best in class. Right. <clears throat> and I think one thing that we're we're kind of all talking about uh, is more of the operational and driving mm -hmm. down. So I'm interested, how important is it to connect to the business language as opposed to just the operational? And how, how does that change how you look at risk and, and calculate it, measure it? Well, I think once you start to ad address it by business, you want to focus on what elements of the business if you know it's impacting, mm -hmm. um, and then associate the revenue of, of the business loss potential because people can understand that much better than they can understand, uh, you know, my server's got five vulnerabilities and, you know, you just lose the audience from an executive level. Mm -hmm. um, so from that perspective, um, defining the risk related to the business operation and the impact to the business operation is very effective in getting behavior change that you need to get things resolved. I would agree with that analysis and, and, and add to it that I have a very strong bias to quantitative over qualitative whenever possible. Mm -hmm. That's not always 100% possible, but most of the time you can get some sort of quantitative analysis done of that, where you're actually saying, look, here is the likelihood of this event happening, mm -hmm. and here is the cost or the impact associated with that event actually happening, and driving that risk down. Yeah. X right. amount of downtime equals mm -hmm. X, well, Y amount of revenue. But also when you're, when you're talking about risk, if you know, and you look at the broader spectrum, you also have brand risk. Right, and you can try to quantify that, but that's where qualitative comes in more Squishy. when you're dealing <laughs> with brand right. risk. Yeah, the one thing is uh, that is good is that board of directors are quite well uh, aware of the importance of cybersecurity and the potential consequences of a security breach. And when you think about the lost revenues, it's not only the revenues from customers leaving, it's revenues from not being able to onboard new customers, it's a loss and expenses associated with all of the legal fees you have to pay, and um, a number of other expenses that would be associated with a security breach. And that is something that is very easy for the executive team to understand and to align themselves with. Yeah. It's almost a revenue loss score and a brand credibility Absolutely. score, a trust score. Mm -hmm. there, there are a couple questions here from the audience. I want to make sure we pay attention to these folks here. Uh, I'll read this uh, in, in full, and whoever wants to respond can. To, so to quantify risk, one needs accurate knowledge of threats. Threat knowledge can be a classified topic in some work environments. How can collaborative risk assessment and mitigation be achieved in such an inhibited threat knowledge environment? So if you're lacking data, how do you... How yeah. do you make those decisions? Um, I'll, I'll start. Um, so I used to complain. I remember 10 years ago when we all complained about nobody's got any data, we don't know how to do this, nobody shares any data when they do have data. Uh, I would argue it's the opposite problem now. We have more data now 
not entirely in every scenario, but in most scenarios in security than we one that we've ever had, and sometimes more than we can actually deal with, right? Now I've got so much noise coming at me, what's important, what's not important, that sort of thing. Now there's companies like ourselves, I'm sure there's you know others in the space that will collect all of this data uh, as it happens, whether it's inside your four walls or outside your four walls, uh, to actually enhance that analysis mm -hmm. and, and do some of that uh, calculations for you. Um, but I would almost argue that we, we've come to the, the, the tipping point where we now have more data than we know what to do with, uh, and a lot of it is noise. Yeah, I would I mention that you know, the question uh, spoke to classified information. I presume right. that comes from someone who works for the government, which right. the problem is yeah, so different there. Uh, yeah, so I'm presuming it's not an overload. Mm -hmm. they're, asked, they're saying, I don't have enough information right. because it's not available to me. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And you know, like, that can be uh, potentially solved by educating the engineering team who has knowledge about the vulnerabilities, how this should be uh, measured and you know addressed. If something is scored as high or critical, absolutely that needs to be addressed. If something is scored as medium, well, perhaps in the context of our architecture, we don't have to address it immediately. Well, you know, if, if there's a specific scenario where they can't get access to data, uh, then I think they need to look at what data they do have access to mm -hmm. and then prioritize the value of the data that they are receiving and then weigh that data to generate their own internal score. So let's say for some reason they don't, you know, there is, it's a controlled environment, it's not something that's exposed to the internet and it's all okay. internal. Mm -hmm. um, doing some special government projects, that could happen. Mm -hmm. And in that particular case, whatever you have, you have to look at those elements and seeing if there's some ways to capture that those data elements um, and then prioritize the value of them and, and assign weights to them and then over time as you get more data continue building your model and, and refining it um, but I, I would agree with Ed today's world <laughs> we have too much data and for the normal enterprise and SMB customer they have a uh, information overload and simplification is their biggest problem I would add, though, even if you lack data the, the, or specific data, right, there is still, there's a lot of analogous data that's out there, right? And maybe this isn't a one-for-one one of the, the threat that would happen or uh, associated with my risk or my event happening here. That doesn't mean that, I mean, we've done a lot of work at, with machine learning and labeled data and looking at all of these different types of uh, features that, that, that ultimately predict things like an exploit of a vulnerability, um, we, we find that a lot of things are related to each other, right? So you, know, you might not have this particular attribute, but these five other attributes basically make that attribute, right? So uh, get as much data as you can, and I think that you'll find that there's data that is relevant most of the time. Yeah. Or perhaps push the risk management model to where the data is and Sure. get the results out of that. Sure. Another idea. So th let me take another question here. It's from a new CA, CISO. Mm -hmm. So let's, uh, they, they want to, or how would you discover the threats to assess the likelihood of risks to the company? So discovery of threats to start with. There's a number of ways to do that. You can, you know, one of the ways is um, leveraging uh, different scanning tools to scan your source code, to scan your applica web application as it's running. Uh, another way is to do penetration testing to really identify like what are some of the vulnerabilities that they discovered. It's following the CVEs. So like the number of sources, there's a number of sources from which you would get the specific vulnerabilities. I would also say, you know, there are threat intelligence products out in the market. Right. You have Recorded Future, you have Dark Isle and uh, Looking Glass and other players in the market that can provide you data. And, and you know, even if you just want to keep it at a high level, how many times is there a brand mention in a dark web about you? Could be a good indicator, especially if you track that over time. And also, how many exposed credentials are out there about you? So if you're able to aggregate that, that would also start to show you where there's interest, right? Because if organized crime and, and professional hackers na or, or, or nation state actors are interested in you, that's pretty a good indication <laughs> that, that you have a higher you know, exposure threat level than compared to just having vulnerabilities, right? Because if nobody cares that you have vulnerabilities, then mitigates some of your challenges, but, but certainly there are definitely threat intelligence products out there that could help. There, so I would add to that and just say, it, it, 
t boiling it down a level, it's, it's about threat modeling, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there's threat actors and there's threat events. And then there's things like vulnerabilities or weaknesses and all of these things go into kind of your risk analysis and trying to figure that out. Uh, quick plug for Adam Shostak's uh, most recent book on threat modeling, which is fantastic uh, if you haven't read that. But really being able to understand, so what is, who, who are the threats, right? Or the threat actors, who is interested in my information or attacking me? You know, what's the likelihood of that occurring? And you're right, if you got a nation state actor as a threat actor, that changes scenarios for what you need to do. Um, you might not have no one that's interested in your vulnerabilities, but there's still the threat of someone who's mass scanning the internet and they're not looking at, to attack you, they're looking to attack the vulnerability that you have and you just happen to have it. So uh, a lot of things go into, well, what's the likelihood of this to happen and what's the impact? Around? Well, and, and sometimes you, you have to look at what business you're in, right? Obviously, if you're a critical infrastructure, you're at a high risk, but you could be a small engineering firm doing work for a defense contractor. and now you're high risk. You can even be a, you know, a facilities company or a laundry business doing work for a defense contractor and your risk exposure is greater because you now become an access point. Right. That sounds like a, a, a vector, <laughs> yeah, a vector uh, in, into the other company. Let's spend a little more time on that because there's a question on, uh, from the audience here. How do you, how do you uh, manage or evaluate vendor risk? So what, what, what's this vendor as a vector idea I'll coin it as? What, what's this concept of just because they work for federal government, they're at higher risk? That makes sense, but that's that's just not the only scenario, right? There are other scenarios. I think another you know, first step would be to understand what is the specific vendor used for. Is this vendor going to have access to my data? Is it this vendor going to have access to my customer's data, uh, my architecture? And once you have uh, that information, based on that, you can determine, am I going to do just high level review of that vendor or is it going to be really deep dive security review. Uh, a lot of you know companies would ask for the attestation reports like SOC2, PCI, but if you are dealing with a vendor that has a critical access to your data, that's not sufficient. You know, it would be like really uh, sit down, deep dive session to how you secure your data, how you develop uh, the platform, and how do you make sure that uh, the platform is truly secure and what would be potential consequences if the data that is exposed. So the, the third parties are essentially another asset, right? That you have uh, to or, or could be an extension of your network team. Yeah. Absolutely. On this, so. Well, you know, and DHS just put out that report about the utility firms, how they were breached through um, vendors that were providing services to off-network components to their operational technology solutions and industrial controls. So uh, a lot of people, when I speak to some companies, they treat their IT and their corporate side as one, and they treat their um, industrial side as a different network, mm -hmm. and they don't necessarily have the same controls on the industrial side, and, and when you talk about knowing your assets, there's a big gap on the industrial <laughs> side of knowing your assets in a lot of cases. So would a lot of our discussion thus far, uh, again, as, and rightfully so, I think we're all very hooked into the IT and security space. Uh, but when we start talking about risk, it, it moves out of that realm fairly quickly. Um, so once you've identified the assets, and you then have to figure out how they help with the particular parts of the business. And the analysis of that goes beyond IT's and security's mind, right? So who, who are some of the other players that need to be involved as part of this process or program? Go ahead. Well, obviously, the, if you have a privacy officer, your legal department would be involved. If you have a risk management or compliance team, they would be involved uh, to quantify it. In some cases, you will need to have finance involved as well. So truly, if you have a good risk management program, you have all those entities involved. When we talked about suppliers and vendors, obviously sourcing or procurement, depending on what it's called in each company, uh, need, has a role in that. So uh, you really need to establish an ecosystem to have a, an effective risk management program with the other key players in the organization to either to provide inputs or to help with uh, quantification. Yeah, the business owners as well. I mean, obviously, uh, there are people within the business or the various products or whatever type of company that you work in that actually are the ones who technically own those systems, right? And they can oftentimes tell you the most about oh, what we actually use these things for and how we process and understanding that whole workflow of what the, what that function of the business uh, goes through those systems or those assets. There's one, there's one point that I like to make in what you said. What I found with enterprise customers, 
nobody owns the infrastructure no. or the applications because it's so dispersed that accountability becomes a challenge. The, the business people rely on their, you know, whoever the technical people are assigned to them, but the business people really don't know the technology in a lot of cases. And the, the technology stack is so broken apart to finding a full end-to-end -end owner becomes very challenging in many uh, enterprise organizations. Or in some cases, you have multiple owners too, right? It's right. like, oh yeah, well this is a web server that's serving up five different applications, mm -hmm. and this team and this team and this team and this team are all business owners of that application. Mm -hmm. So if I take it down, I'm affecting a lot of people, or I'm patching something, I'm affecting a lot of people. Right. Or I have a CRM that's serving multiple departments. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, other large companies, certainly the risk management program overall can be very broad, but I think, you know, for the purpose of this conversation, we should stay within managing the cyber risk and really focus on the engineering part and uh, call it IT or security part. And there are certain elements, uh, certain types of critical data that could be living outside of those core systems, but I think that is fairly limited. Yeah, and I guess the, the one point I would make, and we, Ed and I were talking about this on the way into the room here, is that um, risk, cyber risk isn't just uh, a vulnerability. Mm -hmm. um, it can be a misconfiguration as well. Mm -hmm. And certainly when we look at uh, business processes, just one slight chain or change or mis misstep in how things flow could open up data to leak or an approval to be made that open that allows business email compromise or some phishing attack to succeed, exactly. right? Exactly. So you, might, you might have all, all the technical controls in place, but somebody, you know, got a phishing email and actually just gave the information away well <laughs> the yeah. social engineering itself that's a, <laughs> a conversation topic yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so let's uh, let's take a moment here um, how much of a cyber threat risk to customers this goes back to your, your point of customers how much of a th threat do customers bring to cyber risk do you have a sense of that? Well, I, I, I believe it's, it's an ever increasing. Um, so let me walk through a couple examples. So with customers, um, as customers start to interact, uh, end user customers through mobile devices, their mobile device becomes a platform for hackers to try to get onto and utilize. So uh, some, some of the larger banks are now incorporating within their mobile apps uh, additional technology capabilities to determine whether the device itself is secure or not. Um, one of those companies be like Lookout, where basically they embed their technology into that device and before the app opens it sees if, there's, if it feels that the device itself is harmful and won't let the app open and redirect the user to go to a website or to another device to be able to access uh, their accounts or their data because of those concerns. So that's one level. Um, but in other cases, you have customers that actually have API integrations with your products. Um, and so that opens up another layer of potential vulnerabilities, especially uh, it's companies are not just providing data anymore or information, they're actually ingesting it. And with the ingestion of that data, opens up the possibility of uh, activities happening. Yep, and, 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 and that's where things like integrity also come up, right? right. Is when I'm ingesting that data, am I maintaining that integrity? And some of that actually goes back to our earlier conversation where we were talking about protecting the data versus protecting the example of the five million users on my website. Well, now all these five million users have malware that it's on their own, their laptop or whatever, and now they go to use your banking system and suddenly that's where they, they get owned, right? Mm -hmm. So it's this big, broad ecosystem. So the, the goal with identifying and measuring risk doesn't stop there, right? The, we want to then take that information and take action with it, right? So some mitigations. So your example with, uh, with the mobile app uh, scanning or assessment, uh, it's looking at the risk and, and applying a, a, a remediation or some mitigation or control mm -hmm. to prevent or to handle the, some of that risk. What are some of the other things that companies can do from a response perspective once they have a, a view of their risk? Well, I think, you know, there's, uh, first talking about mitigation, there's the tac tactical level of mitigation when you address the specific risk. And then there's also more strategic when you look at what is causing these types of risks, right? It could be 
uh, broken process that results in having a number of vulnerabilities introduced to your web application because you don't have security for model life cycle. So there's addressing uh, risks from that perspective. And then, you know, you can never eliminate risk, we know that, but you can transfer risk potentially. And, you know, you can look into getting cybersecurity insurance. That is never a replacement for a good security program, but in this day and age, it's absolutely necessary to mitigate any, yeah. any costs that could be associated with a security incident. And yeah, let's talk about that. There's, there's a question from the audience. Is, is it worth it, cyber insurance? So, uh, you know, the, there's more legis more regulatory stuff coming out. I mean, FFIC came out with some guidance that, you know, buying cyber insurance doesn't, you know, prevent, you know, doesn't alleviate you from having the appropriate controls in place, having appropriate security program in place. Uh, I think if you look at cyber insurance and a tactical perspective, it can add value. It's never going to mitigate your brand risk, right? Mm -hmm. But if you have an exposure, and let's say you acquired an entity and they have a, um, an operation that, or an activity that will go away in a short period of time, in that particular limited case, the cyber insurance may be effective compared to the cost of the mitigation or remediation activities you would need to do. Um, but in general, you're not going to buy cyber insurance to protect the entire company. Mm -hmm. It's just cost prohibitive. And it's, it's not the replacement of your security program or your risk program, right? It is, it is one thing. So you're going to transfer some of that risk. You're going to basically hedge to cover some costs because uh, invariable something's going to happen. It might be small, it might be big, but if you have some coverage there, uh, that, that it's helpful, but it's a supplement. It's not mm -hmm. a replacement. Yeah. The other thing I'll say about cyber insurance, I see cyber insurance becoming more sophisticated as we go forward, and they will actually start doing um, proactive risk management of your environment. They will start to say, I'll give you this rate, but I need to get this type of data from you, or I'm going to put devices in your environment to monitor your environment, and, and they'll also be able to modify the premium based on changes that take place. I, th I think we're early Wild West days for <laughs> cyber insurance right now, but I think that is definitely where it's gonna go. In many ways, it's like life insurance. If you are healthy, you get a better rate. If you are not, then it's going to be extremely expensive. Yeah, but the, the, the key is kind of proven, proving your health. It's mm -hmm. a little bit more straightforward, I think, physically. But. Well, it's, it's, it's think of like the devices that like Progressive puts in cars to measure speeding. Mm -hmm. yep. You know, and then they, they can change the premium based yeah. on if you go over. But I, I truly do think that's where cyber insurance for enterprises will go in the future. Because right now they're just writing a premium based on uh, your score, you know, whatever data they were able to collect on you today. Um, and I don't think that's going to be effective going forward. Their exposure will be too great. But right now they're making a lot of money. Doing that. <laughs> Without any actual data. But I think many companies start with <laughs> cyber insurance. Let me just, that's how I'm gonna solve the problem. Um, where I think it, personally, I've done a bit of uh, research and writing on this. I think if, if you look at it as the, do everything else you can within the means and, and, and the tolerance of your, of your revenue and, and budget, and then however cyber insurance can fit in at the end is mm -hmm. good, mm -hmm. but still bring it in in the front. Because to your point, the, they're being pre very proactive because they don't want to pay out, right? So right. the better, right. The more controls you have in place, the better you're managing the risk, the better off they're going to be. So if you bring them in early, you can actually raise the bar of your security posture and, mm -hmm. and uh, hopefully get a better rate as well. well so. um, some of the things, one of the things we wanted to talk about, and I think there's a question here as well, uh, on uh, frameworks. Mm -hmm. And those play a big role in cyber insurance yeah. as well, and third-party risk management too. So how, how do frameworks fit in, and, and are they useful? How are they used properly, misused? Any, any thoughts there? <laughs> I think, you know, frameworks are useful. Quite often they are being misused. A lot of companies think that if I check those boxes, I'm going to be secure, which is a huge misconception. Frameworks like, you know, ISO or NIST can be useful to guide you how to to think about all of the different domains you need to address, but they are very high level. You still have to d uh, dive much deeper in the uh, architecture. Yeah, I think there's there's different frameworks. There's, there's frameworks that are like checklists mm -hmm. of here's a list of controls that you right. should do and best practices. But then there's frameworks that are more based on you know establishing a risk program and, and evaluating risk. Fair would be a great one for that. Active uh, a little bit as well. But um, and I'm personally a, actually a fan of Fair, um, and I think you can apply it to both cyber risk but in general risk as well. 
Um, so I, I think they, they play a, absolutely a key role because it's really kind of a baseline for how you're running and managing your program. So I may be a little biased because when I, when I created the Verizon Risk Report, yeah. I, I, I put a whole bunch of frameworks in there. And, and the point to point frameworks were in there was so that I, all the data that I ingest that I can then, you know, quantify against the framework. And regardless of whichever framework you want to use. Mm -hmm. So you have the ability to uh, choose ISO, NIS, um, and, and I think it's up to like 32 now. Um, but from the perspective is it allows you to visualize depending on who wants it, right? If a compliance person wants it, an order wants it. Okay. And at the same time, it allows you to take multiple data sets in and streamline them against those frameworks to, to be able to visualize it. Because that's the major challenge. You have so much data, what does it mean? And how do they all relate to each other? And then um, and I think that's where the framework's actually very helpful in being able to summarize the data in a way that you can view it. Um, but in and of itself, the frameworks are, are there to help guide you, but they're not the solution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now when you say, that, like, you are listing out NIST and ISO and things like that, are you thinking about more of, like, uh, control mappings of those frameworks to say, okay, here are the things that I do, and then I map them to all these different things, so when Auditor A comes in, I can hand them that, or, or is it well, something different? Well, first of all, if, if you're only thinking about it for an audit purpose, then you already missed the boat. Risk management is, is moved from periodic to daily, right? right. And, and, you know, if you're not doing daily risk management, then you have a bigger problem. But what I'm thinking with, with the um, the different frameworks is the different data that comes in. So let's say you're using BitSight for external um, data, right, to, to let you know what's out there, what your potential liability is. They have 22 risk vectors. You take in those 22 risk vectors and you feed them against the frameworks. They only feed some of it. Now, if you take in recorded future data, they'll feed some additional level of data for you. Now, if you start to look at inside, whether you're using Silence, Tanium, Carbon Black, uh, CrowdStrike, or any other uh, solution, now you can start to take and, and continue to populate those. But then you have to put the human element in there, right? Policies, uh, processes, and checks, and doing assessments to continue feeding in to fill out the frameworks to, to get more and more data so that you can better understand how you're performing against those frameworks and, and where your exposures are. I, I'd agree with that with, with one exception is I think what we're talking about here is a list of activities and proving that you're doing something, right? But that's not a, an activity or even a control or a, and this was a controversial thing that I saw on Twitter a couple of weeks ago is I think it was uh, somebody at the Fair Institute basically said a lack of control is not a risk in itself, which I actually uh, agree with. Um, from an academic standpoint, right? Um, because you've got to have all of the different things in place. Well, what, what's the likelihood of this actually happening to me? What is the actual threat and that sort of thing? And I use the analogy of, you know, if, if I have my daughter and uh, she's got, she doesn't take a, a, a medication to prevent her from getting a, a disease that only affects males, is it a risk that she doesn't take that? No, it's the lack of control that doesn't matter. Um, and it's a terrible example, but it's the one I like to use. Um, Maybe Windows <laughs> Mac is a better. <laughs> yeah. um, so there's, there's frameworks that are kind of a list of controls or a list of activities and things that you are doing. And then there are frameworks that are meant to help you measure and manage risk. Mm -hmm. And I think that they're very different. Right. Well, yeah, I, I, first of all, I think that frameworks are always designed to be generic for a large audience. And an uh, appropriate CISO needs to look at that and see what part of the framework is applicable to their specific business. Yeah. Um, Scope. Yeah. Scope is important. Well, let's, um, let's muddy the waters just a bit more. <laughs> Certifications. SOC 2, just to pick one. <laughs> How do those uh, help or hurt? Well, I think, you know, they've this. been established as the minimum requirement by uh, your customers, something that you typically are required to get if you want to contract with large companies. But, you know, in themselves, they're not sufficient, as I mentioned. You have to really focus on the engineering part of the product and, you know, the true risks. Uh, 
being got the impression that having SOC 2 makes you secure is like one of the big misconceptions. Just like the frameworks, you know, they are very useful if, and helpful if you use them right. Yeah, I agree. I think SOC 2 basically and, and others like that, it gives me as someone who's not inside that company some mm -hmm. visibility as to right. kind of what it is that they're doing at a high yeah. level. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, I have nothing against the uh, AI CPA organization and their desire to generate revenue, but uh, <laughs> you know, what are you, when you're doing any type of certification, the problem is if if it's a point in time certification, it was good the day they issued it. It doesn't mean that tomorrow I have the same configuration it, that it, my risk hasn't changed. Uh, when that happens and then that's really where I think you know the misconception is, is oh I they have a sock too so they must be good or they do, must be doing a good job but again it's point now the other thing and this is you know where my issue is you know I having worked for both KPG and PDC if you fail your your sock too okay fix it and do another sock too mm -hmm. they won't give you the failed sock too I mean, how many how many people actually received a failed SOC 2 report? Well, I don't think there is a pass <laughs> fail, right? So in SOC 2, and there's type 1 and type 2, and type 1, and God, I can't even believe I'm defending SOC 2 because <laughs> I haven't gone through these. But there's type 1, which is that point in time, right? That's, a, oh, on April 1st, you looked good, and then that's it. And then there's type 2, where they sample across a period of time. But uh, that said, the, you're, you're absolutely right. If I did a SOC 2 type 2, and I had a six-month sample, and they come back, and there was... 10 findings that I don't want published on a report, yeah. I'm just not going to publish the report. Right, you won't tell anybody <laughs> that there was a SOC 2. Yeah. You wait, so if you know you had issues six months ago or five months ago, where it was included in the sample set, what you do, you wait another month or two, and then you redo the SOC 2. Yeah. That's what I said. I'm I've never seen a customer give out a failed SOC uh, <laughs> Any provider give here's, out a failed SOC 2. a list SOC of a bunch yeah. of failures yeah. we just <laughs> had. Fundamentally, there is a qualified report, which means you're so horrible that you know nobody wants to do business with you. And you know, it goes back to much uh, broader topic. We want, we need to audit our audit firms to make sure they do actually a good job. And we have to make sure that auditors are held to higher standards and they get the proper training and they get the proper understanding of the modern infrastructure. I would, yeah. I would love for us to <laughs> solve this one. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I, I would love to have a SOC too that like it's valid today and tomorrow it's not valid because they have continuous, but you know, true, yeah. you know control got removed place. or a new risk yeah. surfaced. Yeah, exactly. I think the one, I'll make this point on this and we're gonna have to wrap up. Mm -hmm. I think what uh, frameworks and certifications do is give a, a place to start. Mm -hmm. To your point earlier, they shouldn't be the place you stop, mm -hmm. right? Um, as you said as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but a place to start certainly and brings visibility to the discussion and the discussion up the chain to the board in a consistent way such that perhaps even peers in the same industry can have the same conversation with each other as they looking at this stuff. So that's that's my personal thought on that. We're getting close to the end of our time here. Um, I thank you very much, but I want to get s final thoughts from me. Any, any tips for the folks listening, getting started, staying current, uh, t things to avoid? Rosanna? You know, one tip I would share with everyone is hire the right talent for your team and always stay ahead of the curve. Know what is coming, uh, know what is the new security research that is coming out and the new tools to address uh, risks. Yeah, I'll, I'll summarize by just saying a few things I've probably already said, which is uh, making sure that you've established some sort of baseline uh, framework that you're going to use as a mm -hmm. business, whether that's fair octave or something else, right? Um, getting buy-in from the business is going to be key in who is your audience and making sure that you're talking in their language. Um, and then third is, is threat modeling plays a, a big uh, place here in terms of risk assessment. The uh, takeaway I would give uh, the listeners would be risk management's become a daily activity. If you're not getting daily updates, then you have a gap. Uh, if you're not able to, to simplify the data and present it to an executive audience or board level, you're missing an opportunity. Those are the key things mm -hmm. that you should strive to achieve as you go forward because um, I think that will aid you the most effectively. Perfectly. Well stated, everybody. Mm -hmm. Thank you all very much again for the, for the great conversation. And, and to our audience, thanks for, uh, thanks for taking the time with us today. 
Uh, hopefully it was a, a useful conversation. Hopefully we got to most of the questions here. Uh, any that we didn't get to, maybe we can answer offline, uh, if I can ask the panelists to help with that. Uh, ITSP Magazine is proud to partner with Bright Talk for this live series, six in total, coming to you live from uh, Hacker Summer Camp here in Las <laughs> Vegas. And uh, I believe this is number four, where there are two more, one on security culture and uh, another one, what keeps CISOs up at night. So be sure to tune into those two uh, coming up later today. And of course, stay tuned to ITSPMagazine.com for all of our coverage of everything happening here this week. Thanks, everybody.